Before we get started on today's lesson, which is on friction, okay, um, a couple of reminders. So your Newton lab that we did the other day is due on Tuesday. Your unit two exam is going to be November the 10th. Okay, that was two weeks from yesterday. Okay, so you got your two weeks notice on that one. Um, and we're going to be doing an assignment tomorrow and another lab Monday. Okay, now the lab on Monday, you should, it won't be like the Newton lab where it took us 45 minutes to get the data. Okay, the lab on Monday should literally take us less than 10 minutes to get the data. And then you should be able to get the whole lab report done in class. Right, because you really, there's not a lot to do with it. It's almost a mini lab, but not quite. Okay, uh, so that one will go quickly. And then you'll have all of tomorrow's class to work on the assignment on Newton's second law. And then uh, we're going to be moving on to Newton's third law on Tuesday. Okay, for today, we got to talk about how friction works. Okay, friction is dependent on a couple of things. What do you suppose friction is dependent on? There's some things that could affect friction. Uh, yes, if we're talking about air resistance, yes. The faster you go, the more friction there is. Because the faster you go, the harder you push on the air. And as a result, the harder the air pushes back on you, and so there's more friction. Could heat be affected too? Heat? Yeah. Um, temperature could affect friction in that it affects what we call the coefficient of friction, which is a relationship between the two surfaces. The hotter they get, that number can change. Mass. Mass, yeah. Mass is a big one, okay? Only because mass affects normal force, okay? Normal force. So the heavier something is, the more gravity pulls down on it, and the more the ground has to push up. So something heavier is going to have more friction acting on it from the ground. I mean, if you think about it, if I had two identical boxes and I gave them both, both a shove, okay, sorry, two identical boxes made of the same material but not of the same mass. So I had one that was 100 kilograms and one that was 20, and I gave them both a push. Which one will stop first? Yeah, the 100 one will stop first. It's got way more friction. It pushes on the ground harder, okay? So those are some things that affect friction. Okay? When it comes right down to it, you have a formula on your formula sheet that calculates the force of friction, and it looks like this. Mu times the normal force. Okay? Mu is what we call the coefficient of friction. It's a number without units that basically tells us how sticky the interface is between two surfaces, right? Some surfaces have incredibly high coefficients of friction, and some have very low coefficients of friction. For example, if I put an ice cube in a Teflon pan, I can just move the Teflon pan around. The ice cube would practically stay put. There'd be so little friction between Teflon and ice, because they're both very slippery surfaces. Okay. If I put, uh, let's say, rubber on asphalt, would that be a higher or low friction surface? High. That's why we use those materials for tires and roads. Okay? We want them to be very, very sticky together. Okay? Now, on that note, in the wintertime, obviously traction, and thus friction, because friction is what produces traction, is a problem. What are some things we do in Canada that help us to have more friction? Salt the roads. Okay, we salt the roads. Salting the roads makes the roads, makes the ice melt faster, okay? And that then exposes the asphalt underneath so that we're not driving on the ice, okay? So that kind of affects the coefficient of friction because it changes the nature of the surfaces. We use winter tires. Okay. Winter tires are made of a softer rubber compound that remains pliable at lower temperatures and thus affects the coefficient of friction. Okay. We throw sand and stuff on the road. Okay. So we got salt on the road, we got sand on the road. Those two things actually work together. The sand darkens the snow so it absorbs more sunlight. The salt lowers the melting point of the ice so that 
we get ice melting more quickly. Sand also changes the coefficient of friction a little bit so that we can stop a little bit faster, okay? So everything we've mentioned changes this. Are there anything we do that change this? Anybody drive a pickup truck? What do you put in the back of it in the winter? Weight, yeah, anything that'll make it heavier and get more weight over the back wheels. Sandbags, hay bales, your summer tires, okay, whatever. You got something in the back so that gravity pulls the back of the truck down harder. That makes the ground push harder back on the wheels and increases the normal force, thus increasing the force of friction. Okay, so these are all things that we do to help increase the force of friction, right? Everybody okay with that? So, friction and how to do things the smart way. The person in this diagram is not moving that desk the smart way. What are they doing? Yeah, they're pushing down on the desk. They're pushing the desk into the floor at an angle and trying to move it. Nobody would move a desk that way, okay? How would I move a desk? Yeah, if I want to do that same thing, I pick up the front of the desk and I drag it, okay? Why does that work way better? Well, you're removing, like, not half, but, like, some of the impact of the desk downward, so it's where it's like, easier for the friction to, like, be less. Does that make any sense? No, you're absolutely on the right track. Which part of the formula did I change? The normal force, right? I picked up part of the desk. Now part of the desk's weight is being borne by me. I'm holding some of it. Now there's way less normal force. It doesn't matter whether I push it or pull it, okay? There's way less normal force. So it's way easier to move the desk. Nobody in their right mind would make something push into the ground harder if they wanted to move it, okay? That just makes it dig in, right? We don't want that, okay? So nobody would, in their right mind would try and move a desk this way, okay? But it's just an example. It's hopefully something you'll remember because, well, this is not the smart way to do something. Okay? So what I'm looking at here is I've got this applied force, whatever it is. It's the angled force. It has a horizontal component and it has a vertical component. Okay? Now, the forces acting on this desk in addition to these ones are gravity and normal force. Okay, but I also now have this. So actually, normal force I didn't draw right. How big should normal force be? Yeah, if I wasn't pushing on the desk, normal force would be the same as gravity. But because I am pushing on the desk, I have normal force plus the vertical component of this pushing force. So actually, normal force in this case is greater than gravity, which makes sense. If I push the desk down into the floor, the floor has to push back harder. Okay? That's Newton's third law, by the way. Okay? Every action has an equal but opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law. So normally, gravity pulls the desk down into the floor with, let's say, 50 Newtons worth of force. The floor pushes back up with 50 Newtons worth of force, and the desk doesn't go anywhere. Okay? If I push downwards on the desk, the only way to keep it from going through the floor is for the floor to push back, back harder. Okay, and that's what it'll do, it'll push back hard. All right, so I've got force of gravity, and then I've got my normal force pushing up, and then I've got my you know, horizontal force here. What's opposing the horizontal part of this force? Friction. Okay, if the desk isn't moving, what's the relationship between the horizontal component and the force of friction? Okay, I see Garrett doing this. So they're equal, right, it's zero, okay? The relationship between uh, the applied force forwards and the force of friction backwards is that they're zero. Would it also be zero if the desk was moving at a constant velocity? Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> okay, guys, 
the net force is zero as long as the desk is not what? Moving. No. Nope. Accelerating. Accelerating. If the desk is moving at a constant velocity or not moving, Newton's first law applies. Okay? As soon as the desk is accelerating, then there is a net force. Right? Okay. So, magnitude of static friction. So there's two kinds of friction. Static friction and kinetic friction. Static friction is the friction that is present when objects are not sliding past each other. All right? So when I was pushing down on the desk, like they were in the diagram, like this, and trying to move it, the desk wasn't moving. Okay? I was not overcoming the force of static friction because the desk would not move. As soon as the desk starts to slide, then I'm overcoming kinetic friction. Static friction is always greater than kinetic friction. Okay? And here's how you can remember that. If you're trying to get up the hill over here, get out of the parking lot, and it's really icy, do you want to spin your wheels or do you want them not to spin? You want them to not spin. Okay? There's more static frictional force to help push you forwards if your tires are not sliding past the ground underneath. Okay? If they're spinning, you're relying on kinetic friction, and that does not produce as much force as static friction does. Okay? Make sense? I mean, the other way to think about it is when you're walking. Okay? I mean, as Canadians, we, we just kind of know from experience how to walk on ice. Okay? We know you pick up your foot and you set it down straight down, and then you put all your weight over it, and then you set the other one down, okay? You don't walk like you do on a dry surface where you literally push backwards and the force of friction pushes you forwards, okay? We can't rely on that when it's icy, so we don't walk that way. If we try to walk that way, we'll be relying on kinetic friction, which usually makes you go like this, okay? And then you flip over and look silly and people laugh at you, okay? Um, and I would laugh. Um, but yeah, that's what happens, right? We can't rely on kinetic friction. It's not as great as static friction, right? So we always want to have, um, we always want to have that static friction um, to propel us forward. Okay. Uh, another way to look at it is in a, like if you have a drag race, okay, between two cars, right? I, I know I watched one. It was a couple of years ago now when they came out with the 700 and ungodly number of horsepower um, Dodge Charger Hellcat. Okay? This huge supercharged monstrous thing that was all tire smoke and testosterone. And they did a drag race against a Tesla. And the Tesla smoked it every time. Because every time the race started, the Hellcat did the really cool looking thing, which was enshroud itself in tire smoke, scream to high heaven and let, those in, let that internal combustion just happen. Okay? And the Tesla just went whee and took off. Okay? And the wheel didn't spin, right? There's traction control with the electric motors that made sure none of the wheels were wasting any energy. And it propelled the Tesla forward really, really quickly because it wasn't spinning its tires. It was relying on static friction. Whereas the incredibly cool looking shrouded in tire smoke Hellcat was relying on kinetic friction, which does not produce as much forward force. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So. Um, Static friction and kinetic friction work exactly the same way. That's why we don't have separate formulas. Force of friction is still mu times normal force, but there's a separate set of um, coefficients of friction. Like if you had a data chart, that would be mu s or mu k. In physics 20, we don't really worry about that. We just need to know the difference. We don't actually deal with it very much. Well. Okay. So let's have you guys write this one down. And we'll do it together. Mathematically, it's really, really easy. Okay, so it's back to this person who doesn't know how to move a desk. Okay, so this person is pushing with an applied force of 165 newtons, 30 degrees below the horizontal. Okay, the desk remains stationary. We want to calculate the force of friction acting on the desk, static friction. So the key thing here is that the desk remains stationary. It doesn't move horizontally or vertically. Okay? 
The reason it doesn't move vertically is because there's a y component and an x component to the applied force. Okay? The y component acts downward, gravity acts downward, and normal force counteracts the two of them. Okay? The desk pushes, or the floor pushes harder on the desk okay, as a result of this. Now, what keeps the desk from going forward? Friction. All right, so we know then that the horizontal component of this applied force equals, but is opposite, the force of friction. Okay, so I actually don't have to use that formula I just showed you. All I have to calculate is adjacent. Yeah, the adjacent side, the horizontal component of this applied force. Because the desk doesn't move, the net force is zero. Okay? Static frictional questions are way easier than kinetic frictional ones because they don't involve the movement of the object. We know the net force is zero. Okay? So we've got then that the force of friction will equal um, the force, negative force x, okay? and that's going to be the cos of 30 degrees times 165 newtons. So the force of friction there is 143 newtons, because we have three sig feet. Okay, force of friction is 143 newtons backwards. Okay, so I didn't even have to use mu times the normal force. But a part B of this question might ask, what is the coefficient of friction between these two surfaces? Okay. Then I would have to use this formula. Okay. I know what the force of friction is. I need to find mu. Mu is the force is the coefficient of friction. So how would I get the normal force? Okay, the, the, the desk is not moving vertically either. That means the net force up and down is zero, so force y plus force of gravity would give me normal force. And then I could manipulate the friction formula to get the coefficient of friction. Okay, so it still comes down to a vector, the vector sum of all forces idea. Okay. I put a 10 kilogram box on a 20 degree incline. The box doesn't move. Calculate the force of friction. I could have given you this one last week and you've been able to do it. Okay, so don't think that this part yet involves any of that mu and normal force stuff. Put the 10 kilogram box on the 20 degree incline and it does not move. Calculate the force of static friction. 20 degrees, right? 20 degrees, yeah. Okay, what's the net force in the question? Zero. Zero. The box isn't moving. Okay, I put it on the incline and it didn't slide. Okay, that means that the force of friction is equal to what force? Force parallel. Force parallel. All right, I can calculate force parallel using the triangle we always use for every single incline plane. The second part of this question is going to involve getting this side, okay, getting the normal force. But for right now, I just need to recognize that F parallel, negative F parallel equals the force of friction. They're equal but opposite because the net force is zero. Okay, so F parallel then is going to be the sine of 20 times 98.1. Okay, so 33.55 newtons. Up the ramp. Okay, second part of this question. Calculate. 
calculate the coefficient of friction between the box and the incline. Okay, now I'm going to walk you through this because you haven't done one like this before. Okay, but this is going to take us to this formula. Force of friction equals mu times the normal force. Okay? On an inclined plane, normal force is not equal to gravity. They're only equal if the surface is flat. Okay? And they're working directly opposing each other. On an inclined plane, they don't directly oppose each other. But since I know the hypotenuse and I know this angle, could I calculate the normal force? Yes. Instead of using sine, I'm going to use cos, because it's the adjacent side. All right, so normal force will equal the cos of 20 degrees times 98.1 newtons. Okay, so my normal force is 92.18 newtons. Okay, now that I know normal force, and I already calculated the force of friction, can I calculate mu? Yeah, all I have to do is do what with this? Just divide it over, right? Okay, so force of friction divided by normal force equals mu. So that'll be 33.5 divided by 92.18. Sorry, not 25, 33.55. So that divided by that. All right, so I get that the coefficient of friction here is 0.36, because I only have two significant, it's, sorry, yeah, 36. Okay, there's my coefficient of friction. It has no units. Why? Mathematically, what did I divide to get it? Newtons by newtons, which means they cancel. Okay? This is basically a percentage. Okay? The coefficient of friction is the percentage that the force of friction is of the normal force. So in almost every instance, the coefficient of friction will be less than 1. There are some extreme cases where you will get a coefficient of friction greater than one. That is really super sticky. Okay, those two surfaces. Okay. Everyone follow what we did there? Okay, so this is where the, that, that formula, which is otherwise pretty easy to use, okay, can get a little bit involved because you have to calculate the other side of this triangle that we've never had to do until now. Okay. okay. This one's slightly different. 120 newtons worth of force is pulling up on this 20 kilogram box. Okay, we want to calculate the acceleration of the box up the 25 degree, or maybe it's not up, but it, it should be up, the incline. Okay, so we're pulling up with 120 newtons. Mu is 0.125. Okay, calculate the acceleration of the box. Okay, what are the other forces acting on this box? Force of friction and force parallel. Okay, how do I know friction's acting down? Okay, because the 120 is going up. As long as the 120 is greater than F parallel, this box is going up. If it's not, I'll have to change things around. And that's not a big deal. Okay. All right. So I got to calculate FG. So it's going to be 196.2. Okay. I'm going to have F normal. All right. Um, which I'm going to need. And then I'm going to have F parallel. And this is a 25 degree angle. So I'll calculate F parallel first because I'll need that. That'll be the sine of 25 times 196.2. So 82.92 newtons. 
And then to calculate the force of friction, I'm going to need mu, which they gave me, and normal force, which I don't have yet. So I'm going to have to calculate the normal force. It's the adjacent side, so I'll just go cos 25 times 196.2. Alright, 177.82, but I'm going to multiply that by what? That's the normal force, 177 point, 177 newtons, that's the normal force. I want the force of friction, so I'm going to take that number and multiply it by mu, mu which is 0.125. So it's going to make it a lot smaller. Okay. So I'm going to take that number there, multiply it by 0.125. And we're looking at 22.23 newtons. All right, and this one was 82.92. All right, so that's less than 120, agreed? The two of those forces acting down are still less than 120, so this thing is definitely going up the ramp. Okay, uh, now can I calculate my net force? All right, so F net will be 120 minus 82.92 minus um, 22.23 okay, to get my F net. So 120 minus that number minus that number. All right, so my net force is 14.86 newtons. And now I can calculate my acceleration by just going F net divided by mass. So 14.86 divided by 20 kilograms. All right, so the acceleration is 0.74 meters per second squared. Is that really a whole lot different than what we were doing before? No, it's just every time before I just told you what friction was. Okay? Now I make you do an extra step to calculate and I just set a bother. Is it kind of like an easy post friction? Or is it just really easy? Um, I would say on a test I'd probably make it a bit different than this. I wouldn't likely make it part of an incline plane question just because there's extra steps that make that question take up more time. If I want to test inclined planes, I probably don't test force of friction as part of that. I would just give you what the force of friction is. Okay. okay. Uh, we already did one like that. Yeah, we already talked about that. Doesn't really change anything. Okay, we did one like that. We just did one like that. Okay. No, no. Where's the one I want? Okay show you this. These are the different coefficients of friction okay, for different surf surfaces. Okay? So copper on copper is an extremely sticky interface. Okay? Sliding two pieces of copper past each other is really hard. The coefficient of friction between them is 1.6 if it's static and 1.0 if it's kinetic. Remember I told you it's very rare that you're going to get a coefficient of friction greater than 1? Okay? That's one of those rare cases. Where are these made? Uh, they're an alloy, so they're, they're copper and uh, probably some tin and stuff like that. Um, so when you say static or kinetic, so static is just when it's like on top of each other, not moving, and right. kinetic can be if it is? They're sliding past each other. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, steel on dry steel, 0.41 and 0.38, but look what happens when you grease the steel. Okay, so you got steel on steel, then you got steel on greased steel. Look what happens to the coefficients of friction. Okay, they drop considerably. That's why you put oil in your car. Okay, if you don't put oil in your car, it will die violently. Okay, the oil light comes on, pull over and turn the car off. Okay, don't keep driving if the oil light comes on. That will kill your car. Because if it runs out of oil, the coefficient of friction between the pistons and the cylinder walls will go to this and then to this. And when it gets to that, the pistons stop moving and the engine destroys itself. Okay? It's called seizing. Okay? 
There's so much heat generated that the metal of the pistons and the metal of the cylinder walls expand and squeeze each other, okay, until the pistons cannot go up and down, the connecting rods disconnect and go through cylinder walls. And at that point, usually oil sprays everywhere. And then there's a cloud of smoke and a horrible screeching sound as your car dies. Okay, so, yeah. Lubrication is very important for internal combustion engines. Make sure your oil is changed and filled regularly. Okay, it makes a big deal. Okay, uh, so some other ones here, rubber tire on dry asphalt. There's another really high number. Why we use those for tires and roads. Okay, um, rubber tire on wet asphalt. Coefficient of friction cuts in half by making the, the uh, asphalt wet. Okay, rubber tire on dry concrete, another pretty tall a pretty high coefficient of friction. Uh, wet concrete, it goes down a bit. Look at the rubber tire on ice. Yeah, we know how that works. Okay? We live in Canada, we know what that's like. Okay? Driving, going towards the stoplight, turns red, hit the brakes, and your speed doesn't change. Right? You just keep going. Right? Newton's first law in full effect because your coefficient of friction is practically nil. Okay? So keep that in mind, it's supposed to snow tomorrow. Yes. Probably won't be cold enough to get really icy, but you know that's coming because it's almost November. Okay, curling stone on ice. Okay, that's why there's so much technique to curling. Okay, uh, why you have to spin the rock to make it turn, and if, if you have a really good sweeper, why they can actually steer the rock. Okay, so if you've got a curling rock on a sheet of ice, okay, so it looks like this, and the curling rock is going this way. Okay, so if this is the curling rock, if the person sweeps, more on this side than on that side, the curling rock will do this. Okay, especially if the curling rock is turning, if someone has spun it, okay, because there's less friction on this side than there is on this side. It causes this side to slow down more than this side, and the rock will turn. So if you have someone who really knows what they're doing, in terms of sweeping, they can literally steer the rock. Now, I'm not saying they can move it like three feet okay, in either direction, but they can control it probably six or eight inches over the course of its entire trip down the ice. Okay, Why does sweeping do that? What are they doing when they sweep? Yeah, they actually melt the ice. If you've ever curled, okay, um, the, the ice is different than like hockey ice. They're, it's dippled. So what they do is they first have a sheet of ice and then they go out there with a hose and they just spray water droplets into the air and the water droplets land on the, on the ice and freeze into these little pellets okay, that are on, on the ice. When the people are sweeping, they actually melt those pellets okay, and that creates a water interface between the rock and the ice, almost like hydroplaning. Okay, and that actually reduces the friction even more. Okay? The same thing happens when you spin your tires Okay, now on the ice, you melt the top layer of the ice, which creates a nice layer of water to lubricate the tube, okay? lowering the coefficient of friction even more. Okay? Um, and so they, they will travel further if they're swept. Okay? Well, they can be steered if they're swept really, really well. Okay? And then uh, synovial fluid on your joints. Okay? So you guys are young, so you still have lots of this stuff in your joints. Okay? But it's the, the lubricating fluid that's inside your knees and shoulders and elbows and stuff like that. Okay? When you get old like me and you've destroyed all your cartilage and your bone on bone, you don't have as much of that anymore. Okay? And so your, your joints make these creaking sounds when you go up the stairs, usually accompanied by the creaking sounds you make as you go up the stairs. because you know, okay? yeah. It's called age, and it knows where you live, and it's coming for you too. Enjoy it while it lasts. All right, I don't want to do that. Where's the one I want? It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's the one I want. There's the one I want. Nope, it's not. Oh, come on. There it is. All right. All right. I have a 20 kilogram box and it's sitting on a level surface. It is being pulled by a 400 newton force angled 10 degrees above the horizontal. The box will slide horizontally. It's not going to move in this direction. The coefficient of friction between the box 
and the surface is 0.255. Calculate the acceleration of the box. Okay. There is a vector component to this that you need to keep in mind. Okay, so keep in mind that this is actually a vertical and a horizontal force combined. Okay? All right, first thing I want to do is calculate the horizontal and vertical components of that pulling force. I know the box isn't going in the direction of the pulling force, so I just want to know what its vertical and horizontal components are because they're what really affects this movement. Okay? So the force horizontal will be the cos of 10 degrees times 400 newtons. Okay, so cos of 10 times 400 is 393.92. All right, and then I want to calculate the force vertical as well. It'll be the sine of 10 degrees times 400 newtons. And that's 65.46, or sorry, 69.46. Okay, now that I have those two forces, I'm going to do this. Box doesn't move that way. I have now accounted for that force in that I have calculated, whoop, not what I wanted to move. The horizontal component and the vertical component just go all over there. Okay. Oh, really? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Okay, here. All right, and I know what those two values are. What are the forces I'm missing on here? Gravity. And it's going to be uh, 1,962 newtons. Okay, sorry, 196.2 newtons. All right, what other forces am I missing? Force normal. And what else? Force of friction. Won't be static because we're actually calculating acceleration here, but okay. All right. I know what the force horizontal is. I know that this is 393.92 newtons. Okay? I know the box is accelerating that way because the question kind of told me that. Okay? Um, so I need to know what the force of friction is. If I'm going to calculate the, the acceleration, I need the net force, and I don't have it. Right? How do I calculate force of friction? Mu, mu times the normal force. Okay. How do I get normal force? Okay? Normal force, force vertical, and FG add up to zero. How do I know that? Because the box isn't moving vertically. If the box doesn't move in the vertical direction, all the vertical forces add up to zero. All right, so if I take my 196.2 and I subtract the force vertical, which I already calculated, that will leave me with the normal force. So I take my 196.2 and I subtract uh, that's 69.45. That leaves me with a normal force of 126.74. Now I can calculate my force of friction because they told me what mu was, and then I can calculate the net force and then the acceleration. Here's the most common mistake with this question. People forget about this force vertical, and they just say normal force and gravity are Okay? If the box was being pulled horizontally, that would be true. 
But because the box is being pulled vertically, it's just like what I did at the beginning of the class when I lifted this desk a little bit and then backed up with it. I took some of the weight off the floor, which meant that the normal force decreased and it was easier to move the desk because I lowered the force of friction. All right, so then my next step is mu times the normal force. So that'll be 0.255 times that number there. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Okay, um, so there's my force of friction, 32.31. All right, now I can calculate my net force. It'll be this 393 minus the force of friction. Okay, there's my net force. Divide net force by mass. That box is moving. Okay, because it's accelerating at almost twice the acceleration due to gravity. That is a good pull. Okay, so I'm getting really yanked on that one really hard. Okay, but that's the situation we're in. Everybody with me there? That's as involved as a Newton's second law problem with friction will ever get in physics. Is there a lot to do in that one? Yeah. But does it still break down to mass times acceleration and vector sum of forces? Yes. Yeah. Just it gets more complex in the interim. Okay. We'll leave it at that for today.